was a real treat and I'm really excited. And I feel like we kind of bent the rules a little bit so I could talk about Pan uh, because he's my favorite God, I think, in a lot of ways. He is not the kindest, most gentle God either, but he is sort of my favorite. And he was like the first male God I think I ever had a real attachment to and it was kind of by accident. But I've been a huge uh, fan of Pan, for lack of a better word, for quite a while. And I've been doing workshops about him for, gosh, 15 years. Recently, I just got done writing a book called The Horn God of the Witches. And there's a whole chapter on the history of Pan in that book. And it was really fun to kind of go back and see how my ideas have changed and what I got wrong when I was first writing about Pan and doing workshops on Pan. So that was a sort of a real eye opener. It's not particularly written about by scholars or historians very much. And I think it's safe to say that in ancient Greece and his worship went much farther than ancient Greece too. I mean, Pan was a God that was worshiped as far as Great Britain and into India. It's a long swath of the ancient world where he was worshiped just like most of the Greek and Roman gods were worshiped over that wide of an area. Uh, so, but anyway, he's, you know, it's been fun to see kind of where I was wrong and what I got right over the years. So I'm going to share my screen with you all because I'm a huge fan of PowerPoint and it also makes me less nervous not to have people look at me talk. So that's really good for me. And you all can see the screen, I think. All right, excellent. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about my early days and being interested in mythology. And Pan was one of those figures that would kind of come up and then quickly be forgotten about. He has, a, he has some myths, but the myths are really just stories of him chasing nymphs, usually not in a very polite way. One of the funniest things about Pan is when he's written about in books for children, they have trouble expressing his, his mythology very well because of its negativity and stuff. And so they kind of dress him up and make him look less sinister than he really is. Um, and in a lot of ways, that sort of modern version of Pan has become kind of the default in a lot of places. There are people who really don't know a lot about how he was worshiped in the ancient world because our depictions of him have changed so dramatically and especially over the last 200 years. And at the very end of this, we'll talk about some of that to a degree. Let's see. Uh, I think when you start to talk about Pan, people think of him as a Greek god. And that's true. He was worshiped in ancient Greece. But even more importantly, he was a god of Arcadia, which is a region in Greece. You can see Arcadia shaded in on the map there. And Arcadia is very different than city-states like Athens. It was a very, very rural area. There was not a lot of agriculture in Arcadia. There weren't a lot of temples or cities or towns. It was a rural place. It was where the hillbillies of ancient Greece lived for lack of a better term. And it's in this area that Pan was born. Some of Arcadia's problems are the result of its geography. It is very, very rocky. It's very, very hilly. So you cannot plant trees, you can't, or you cannot plant crops and things. So Pan kind of sets his roots there and he grows out of there. The main profession in Arcadia for a lot of people was being a shepherd because it was really all you could do is shepherd goats in that very rocky area of Arcadia. The ancient Greeks though romanticized Arcadia to a great deal. I think people who lived in Athens were always looking for a more pure existence for lack of a better term and they looked to Arcadia with its ruralness as sort of this tranquil place, the home of the original Greeks. And this is something that would be attached to Pan again and again over the centuries, this connection to rural areas. But it's likely that Pan has some origins that lie outside of Arcadia and Greece. The name Pan comes from the root word pa, which means pasturer. 
And there are a couple of other deities in the ancient world who share some of his attributes and share some of the origins of his name. The most probably important for um, our purposes is this particular god named Pusin, who was a Vedic god of pathways. You can see him there riding a cow, which is something he was often pictured doing. And like Pan, he was a god of shepherds. He watched people who watched animals and livestock. So they sort of have that thing in common. He was also a god of roads and travelers. And Pan was a god, not really someone who cared about roads and travelers, but if you think about roads, they're, they're outside of town. There's a little bit of civilization attached to a road, but at the same time, you're out in the middle of nowhere. Pan was a god who liked the trappings of civilization, but he didn't like the people in civilization. So putting him close to Rhodes makes some sense. Hermes is generally thought of as the god or as Pan's father, the god of the dad of our god that we're speaking of. And Pan and Hermes are very similar in a lot of respects. Though we don't think about Hermes today being a phallic god, like Pan, he was often pictured with an erect phallus. What you see on the right there is a Herm, and a Herm was used as kind of a directional sign in some places. Uh, there were signs that said, you know, Athens this way with the giant penis pointing the way uh, to Athens or Sparta or whatever it is. And people would use Herms as devotional places to worship Hermes. There's a thought that Pan and Hermes were the same deity at some point, and then Arcadia, because of its geography and kind of getting landlocked, so to speak, since not a lot of people came in or went in and out of that area of Greece, that Pan ended up sort of developing as a separate god because he was separate from everything else in that area of Greece. It's hard to say if it's true or not, but they do share certain attributes, and Hermes, like Poussin, is also a god who watches over travelers. So all of these gods have a couple of different things in common. Pan in modern Greek means everything or all, but to the ancient Greeks, that's not really what Pan meant because it comes from the root word pasturer. That's also means shepherd. And when people talked about Pan in the ancient world, they often talked to, about him as a shepherd. One of the things about shepherds is they're sort of like that road that's a part of civilization and a part of not civilization. Shepherds live apart from cities and towns. They live apart from people just watching their flocks. It's a very solitary existence. And this is the kind of existence that Pan really liked. And we'll see later pictures of him having sex with goats and stuff because there was nobody else around. But also uh, because of that isolation, Pan is also said to be the god of masturbation, which I've always thought was kind of a funny little factoid. Uh, Pan amongst the ancient Greeks was always kind of a B plus god, maybe a B, even a B minus god. He was not the most popular of ancient Greek gods. However, he was someone that often showed up in art and he was often seen with Dionysus. So in a lot of, a lot of times, Dionysus and Pan were worshiped together. There's some interesting mythology talking about how Pan and Dionysus did a lot of activities together. They do share one attribute. They both really enjoyed the wine skin. Again, Pan doesn't like civilization, but he enjoys the fruits of civilization, most specifically wine. Pan's worship in the ancient world didn't really take place in temples as we think of it today. So when we think of ancient Greece, we often think of the Acropolis and there's the sanctuary to Athena at the top of the Acropolis there. And around that whole structure of the Acropolis are various places to honor the other Greek gods. Some of them don't really survive because they were made out of wood and not marble, but a lot of them are still there. And it's not just for Athena. It was a place for all the Greek gods. At the base of, Acro of the Acropolis, and if you ever go there as a tourist, it's one of the first things you'll see, is a small area, very isolated, 
very far away from everything else. And you can see it there at the top picture there on the upper left. That's where Pan was worshiped near the Acropolis. I don't think he was worshiped like he was in a zoo. The bars there are just to keep people out, but Pan was generally worshiped in caves. And there happened to be some small caves there at the bottom of the Acropolis. So that's where they decided to put their area to honor Pan. In most other places, Pan was honored in temples and grottos that were caves, but they were generally outside the city. Usually a walk of maybe three to eight miles. Again, I want to be close to civilization, but I don't want to be that close to civilization. Some of the most well-preserved spots where Pan was worshipped are actually in Israel of all strange places. And if you Google Pan Grotto, most of the pictures that you get are from that surviving spot in Israel. I guess like Jesus, you know, they were both shepherds and liked to hang out. Pan, we think of him today primarily as a god of lust. You know, when you think of people talk about Pan, they talk about a lusty God. And that was true in the ancient world. Pan was thought of in that way. But if you look at his myths, they're always about running after nymphs and trying to take nymphs to bed and usually failing in his exploits. And usually after Pan would fail, something new would sort of arise out of what had happened. The most well-known story is Pan chasing Syrinx, the nymph, and she turns into reeds, and then he fashions the Pan flute out of those reeds. Scholars call Pan's sexuality panic sexuality. And the idea is it's not a sexuality built on love or trust. It's the idea of sort of lust in the moment. And because Pan is very rarely fulfilled in that lust for the moment, it also sort of implies that this is not a good form of sexuality. And that while sometimes it, you might have a reward for a while, you're probably not going to have a long-term reward. And you should probably kind of try to avoid this way of being. I think it's one of the reasons that Pan is the inventor of masturbation because he had nothing else to do uh, because his attempts to chase nymphs usually didn't work. Pan was a god of a couple of other things though too. He was said to be a god of hunting, which makes sense given that he came from a more rural area where hunting was a necessity for life uh, to get by. Pan was often associated with dogs because of his hunting prowess and the dogs would be around him while he hunted. And then there, of course, is the Pan pipe, one of the most uh, commonly associated things with the god. You know, there's a story where he goes up against Apollo in sort of like an ancient version of uh, the voice or something where they're competing against each other. And King Midas is the judge, and it's Pan that wins the day because the Pan pipes were exceedingly beautiful, if a little bit primitive. The, in the ancient world, one of the things about Pan, uh, they believed that he was a god that seldom spoke. And if you had an interaction with Pan, you generally had this interaction with the god because he played his Pan pipes to you. And the pipes were so moving that you could interpret various things from the pan pipes, like they played to your emotions. Uh, so the pipes were very, very important to him and how he was seen. One of the things about Pan that I have uh, always kind of been fascinated with, sorry, I need a little coffee. Um, one of the things about Pan that I've always uh, really kind of been fascinated with was how he was depicted in art and what we can say about the God because of that depiction in art. 
This is a very, very famous statue of Pan, the goddess Aphrodite, and her son Eros, uh, better known as Cupid in the Roman world. And I actually got to see this statue a couple of years ago before we were all kind of confined to our houses. My wife and I got to go to Athens. And it's often described as if Aphrodite is getting ready to hit him with a shoe, uh, that it's a very negative piece of art. I've always found it rather playful. And Eros is there, which implies a degree of love. And I don't think Aphrodite looks that angry. Uh, to me, it looks like maybe they're getting ready to have some fun or she's going to shoo him off nicely instead of violently. Pan was often said to delight the other Greek gods, even though his appearance was quite strange compared to the rest of them. And that delight, I think, could be seen there on her face, uh, which I think is really pretty cool. One of my favorite things about Pan is how he was worshipped in ritual. And Pan's worship in ritual was really different than a lot of the other Greek gods and how they were worshipped. One of the reasons for that is probably because he did not have the temples that often uh, were in Athens and other places. So Pan's worship was really different for lack of a better word. And he didn't have a lot of feast days. He didn't have a lot of particular moments when you were supposed to honor the God. In Athens, there was a run every year for Pan in January that he shared with the Titan Prometheus, but there was never like a specific holiday just to worship Pan. And when people worshiped Pan, they generally did so because they, were, they thought that they needed to for whatever reason. It's possible that Pan came to them in a dream or they were looking to bring some fertility or sexual excitement into their lives. For whatever reason, people would decide that we need to worship Pan. And you could worship Pan really in two different ways at the grottos that he lived in. You could take your paramour, loved one or lust one, with you down to the grotto and have a ritual for Pan there. Or you could have even more fun and take a giant group of people with you to do this Pan ritual. And if you think that these are this is going to go to kind of a dirty place, you're absolutely right that it's going to kind of go to a dirty place because they did have orgies and that kind of thing in honor of the Greek Pan. So, when you were doing your ritual in Pan, for Pan, you'd gather up everyone who was a part of the rite, and one person would have to play the Pan flute while everyone was gathering, and basically for the rest of the ritual, because it was seen as a way to honor the god. And then you would probably leave whatever large city that you lived in around noon. And it was important to leave around noon because Pan is the god of napping, and you did not want to intrude upon the god while he was in the middle of his afternoon nap. The word panic actually comes from the god Pan. And people aren't exactly sure what Pan's panic meant. Uh, was it good? Was it bad? We know that when Pan caused panic to an army, that army would turn on itself and begin like fighting itself, like the Babylonians would fight other Babylonians, that kind of thing. Uh, so panic had some violent and negative associations with Pan, uh, but also there's a panic that's probably good where your senses are heightened and you're more likely to have some sort of religious experience. There's a reason we all watch horror movies or a lot of us watch horror movies. I mean, horror movies don't make you feel good, but horror movies, though, there's something that kind of tingles within us and our way of feeling the world kind of changes. And it's felt that way with Pan when the panic step, when the panic sweeps over people. And you never wanted to get caught up in the panic, especially if you were unaware that it was coming. So it was important 
to play the pan flute and maybe sing a couple of songs and head to the grotto and see pan that way. The Greeks did not use drums. There's often this idea that there were probably a lot of drummers associated with the Greek pan. The Greeks liked tambourines, but they didn't like traditional drums. So you probably had a few people banging on some tambourines. The pan flute is playing as people come to the grotto. Once they arrive at the grotto, they have to give the god some sort of sacrifice. You know, people, when they think of sacrifice in the ancient Greek world, they think of animal sacrifice. And yes, there were animal sacrifices, but for the most part, a god like Pan, there weren't a whole lot of animals sacrificed to Pan. Usually, if somebody was going to do a Pan ritual, they would bring some sweet cakes with them and some wine, and that is the offering that they would leave to the god. If it was a very important rite, like they were trying to do something very, very important, maybe like conceive a child. They might bring a goat to sacrifice or sheep to sacrifice. Sacrifice, sacrifice of animals sometimes sounds so horrific, but the animals were generally killed humanely and then they were eaten. It was a way to get a meat dinner. The meat was boiled. The undesirable parts of the animal were what was burnt and given to the gods. But as I said, with Pan, that didn't happen a whole lot. So the sacrifice would be made. And then the men and women would separate. And one of those groups would get to drink and have a good time. And then the other group would get to wait for a sign from the god, which they called a vigil. And once they had that sign, then the ritual could really begin. The, the signs could really vary. It might be just somebody saying, hey, I hear pan pipes in the distance. Somebody might have a vision of the god. They might hear a hoof on the ground or something. Whatever it was that got them to that point where they could do the ritual would really vary. One of the things that's really interesting, though, about this, when the men and women split is, in a lot of Greek religion, when such splits happened, it was always the women that had to wait and do the vigil. It was always the men who got to drink and carry on, but the worship of Pan was a lot more democratic. And both sides sometimes did the vigil, and then other times they got to do the drinking and kind of like the pre-partying as they waited for the ritual to start. Once the sign was in there and they had their sign and they were ready to start their ritual, they would line up men on one side, women on the other side, and they would hurl insults at each other. And this sounds really stupid and strange, you know, to think that you're gonna do a religious rite and then you're just, you know, going to say mean things to each other. But I'm of the opinion that if you think about how we acted as children, when we liked somebody, we often teased them quite a bit. And I think that that's what this sort of uh, ritual part was for. It was a way to tease each other. It was a way to kind of get the blood pumping and things stirring, and maybe that tension could lead to other things. So everybody would insult each other. There's a guy playing the pan pipes in the background still while all this is going on. And then at some point after the insults were hurled at each other, the two sides would begin the ritual in earnest. And since it was a pan ritual, it was exactly what you think it was. They would have sex for hours. There was usually an orgy. It was considered bad form for the ritual to end before the sun came up. So after your walk and after your other things, maybe you're starting the ritual at eight or nine, and then you have to go all the way till six or seven in the morning, all while that person is sitting there playing the pan pipes. Pan was a god of dancing and dance was very sacred to him. So during all of this activity, there's certainly going to be dancing going on. There's also going to be a lot of drinking going on because that was a way to honor the God as well. So you have sex, drinking, dancing, poor Gary, the flute player playing the flute in a corner. And in the middle of the ritual, the women there would engage in a sound 
that they called a Krug, K-R-A-U-G-E. And it was sort of this guttural sound. I think it's supposed to sound like this, like Krug, and it's really hard to do with your throat and it makes you wanna cough. But while all of this activity was going on, and you can think of it being quite chaotic, all of a sudden now you've added this other element with this very strange sound. And I think that sound goes back to panic again, because you have all of this crazy energy in this small place and it's amplified then with that sound and it probably makes you a little wary. And because of that, I think it makes you more receptive to feeling the energy of the God, perhaps even seeing the God. There were stories of sometimes Pan himself showing up. Uh, Pan was often called the leaper because his dance was so ecstatic and he could jump so high while he was doing the dance. It's very unlikely that the God showed up in a physical form, but people could really say that they felt the energy of the God there. One of the things that Pan did not do in a good way, and the Greeks didn't really do this at all anyways, um, in a lot of modern pagan traditions, you have activities such as drawing down the moon where deity descends into the body of someone. And for the Greeks, that was really sort of taboo and frowned upon. There was a condition called panalepsy where it was said that Pan entered the human body but panalepsy was not something that you wanted. It was said that Pan was possessing people as a way to punish them because they were not doing enough things in their life that Pan thought that they should do. Uh, so if you were suffering from panalepsy, it was not a good look and it was not something that you wanted to have happen. And during these Pan rituals, no one came, became possessed by Pan. However, I do feel like they felt his energy while they were doing all of these things because they were doing all of these things that were extremely sacred to the God. Once dawn happens, the ritual can end, the God is thanked and everybody tiredly walks back to where they came from with the hope that whatever it is they were trying to get out of Pan, uh, they receive. One of the things about Pan in his grottos he never lived there alone. He was always said to share these spaces with nymphs. And when you gave your original sacrifice to the God at the beginning, the cakes were said to mostly be consumed by the nymphs while Pan greedily only really wanted the wine. It's worth, as we talk about Pan and him having sex at rituals and people doing it in his honor, it's important to point out that Pan's sexuality was not limited uh, to male-female coupling. Pan praised all forms of coupling, just like every Greek god really did. Pan had a multitude of male lovers, as well as the female lovers that he tried to attract as well. One of the interesting things about Pan in the ancient world, and this is not something that most people are aware of, he was sometimes drawn as a female figure. Uh, there were male and female pans. I often get asked, you know, are these just satyrs in disguise? And satyrs, which were goat-like men who resembled pan in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, they could be, but there's just something kind of sexually ambiguous about pan in certain places. And uh, pan, by some artists, especially towards the end of his worship exclusively in Greece, really beginning during the Roman period, he was pictured male and female, depending on the artist. Certainly the majority of pictures of Pan show him presenting as a male, but I love this sort of other side to the God because it's a side I think that can be embraced by more people. As I said at the beginning, one of the things about Pan and his name is in Greek, it means everything or all. And because of that, there has been sort of a transformation around Pan for the last 200 years, especially. But it, but it began 
a little bit before that and began in, during the Italian Renaissance in about the year 1350 to 1400. And the Italians during the Renaissance, they wanted to catalog everything and write about everything. And they wanted to write about the Greek and Roman gods. And if you were to go to Rome in the year 1350, you would have probably thought that everybody there was a pagan because there were so many images of Roman gods everywhere in the city. Uh, all of a sudden, after a period of dormancy, uh, the Roman gods sort of rose up again and became like one of the most popular artistic mediums, most, like, most likely because Christian deities don't portray emotions and feelings very well. But all of the Roman gods have very specific ways of being and like when you show Aphrodite, you're showing love and beauty. When you show Ares, you're showing war. And these encyclopedists of the Renaissance, they looked at Pan in a really different sort of way. And they looked at his name as it was translated in modern Greek as everything or all. And they began to see the God as representing the earth as a whole and as a way to communicate with the Christian God. So as you see this image here, they would talk about Pan's hooved feet and they would talk about how that connected him directly to the earth in a very primal, organic, natural way. His Pan flute played to the various spheres of heaven and it was a music that could be heard and loved and interpreted by lots and lots of different people. And they saw the horns as sort of like antennas that reached up directly to the heavens and directly to the Christian God. It's a completely different sort of reimagining of the God than what had happened in the ancient world. And it's a really beautiful and poetic one. There was some inklings of this in the ancient world there were a few Christian writers who got the God's name sort of combobulated because they were looking at it as to what Pan meant in modern Greek, everything or all, and they kind of lost the shepherd associations. But it was really from the Renaissance where this idea takes off. And the, the idea ends up becoming really, really written about by English poets a couple of centuries later. And to me, that's completely hilarious because when I think of a Greek God, I don't think of the English countryside. But in about the year 1800, something really, really amazing begins to happen. And Pan all of a sudden goes from being a deity that's not written about in literature to being the most written about deity in all of English literature. And this occurs just over a span of about 180 years. So it's a really small uh, sample, like it's really a small uh, time period, but Pan just kind of blows up. A lot of that is because of the changes that were happening in English society at the time. In the year 1800, 80% of people who lived in England lived in rural areas and 20% lived in cities. A hundred years later, 80% of people lived in urban areas and 20% lived in rural places. So you kind of had this entire change of how society and life is ordered. And to make sense of it, people began looking for a connection, an anchor to the natural world and to nature. And because of some of the deficiencies in a lot of uh, Christian myth, they found it in the Greek god Pan. Again, this plays into how he was seen amongst some Greeks, especially Greeks in sophisticated areas like Athens. He was the god of the countryside. And English poets began to adopt Pan as the god of the English countryside. It's, he's kind of interpreted in two ways during this period. Uh, the first is what we call the Orphic Pan, a god that could be felt but not seen. Uh, again, a god probably communicated with the panpipe or the whisper of the wind instead of direct words. 
And then there was the second way that Pan was depicted in a lot of poetry. He would be the God that if you were just in the right place at the right time and just parted the boughs of a tree just right, you could probably see him splashing in a pond with some nymphs or something. Uh, one of the first people to write about Pan was William Wordsworth. And he wrote about Pan in the Orphic sense. Uh, one of his first poems about Pan dates from 1806. And he wrote, clouds lingering yet extend in solid bars through the gray west and lo these waters steeled bright breezeless air to smoothless polish yield a vivid repetition of the stars jove venus and the ruddy crest of mars amid his fellows beauteously revealed at happy distance from earth's groaning field where ruthless mortals wage incessant wars is it a mirror or the nether sphere opening to view the abyss in which she feeds her own calm fires, but list a voice is near, great Pan himself, lit low whispering through the reeds. Be thankful thou for if unholy deeds ravage the world, tranquility is here. And you know, it's that moment where you can just kind of hear Pan whispering just from outside of things and after a period of seven, like what, 400 to like 800 years, the God has kind of come back in a way to people. Uh, most of us have heard of uh, Percy Shelley because he's the husband of Mary Shelley who wrote Frankenstein. Frankenstein, he and John Keats, which was a contemporary of his, they both wrote a great deal of poetry about Pan. However, they were probably influenced to do so by a man named Lee Hunt, who is not particularly famous today. And he's also not a very good poet, but he was a mentor to Keats and to Shelley. And apparently he worshiped the God Pan, like in a very real tangible sort of way. Uh, so this is a little bit of a letter that he wrote in 1821. He said, if you all go on so, there will be a hope someday that old Vanzetarts and others will be struck with a panic terror and that a voice will be heard along the water saying, the great God Pan is alive again, upon which the villagers will leave off starving and singing profane hymns and fall to dancing again. It's a really beautiful passage. Um, one of the things about Lee Hunt is his biographers all say that he was probably an atheist but to me, when I read that, it feels very much like he's actually worshiping Pan in some sort of way. Um, there's, let's see, um, there's so many little uh, bits of Pan poetry that are worth, that I love to share, but I don't have time to share all of it. But uh, this is one of Keats's poems. It's called, I Stood Tiptoe Upon a Little Hill. And one of these things, uh, one of the things about this particular poem is it really captures that pan of the English countryside. And if you like listen to the words, you can almost like see pan splashing in the waters. And Keats writes, so did he feel who pulled the boughs aside that we might look into a forest wide to catch a glimpse of fawns and dryads coming with softest rustles through the trees and garlands woven of flowers wild and sweet upheld on ivory wrists or sporting feet, telling us how fair trembling syrinx fled Arcadian Pan with such fearful dread. Poor nymph, poor Pan, how he did weep to find naught but a lovely sighing of the wind along the reedy stream, a half heard strain full of sweet desolation, balmy pain. And you know, that opening, so did he feel who pulled the boughs aside that we might look into a forest wide. There he is just sort of waiting to hang out with us if we look just right. And then at the end, Pan broken and sad because of his poor chase. In later times, there would be people who would write about Pan in urban settings because again, he was that way to reconnect with, with things. Uh, James Elroy Flecker wrote in 1916 about the changing urban landscape, and he included Pan in this sort of meditation. 
When I go down the Gloves Chester lanes, my friends are deaf and blind. Fast as they turn their foolish eyes, the maenads leap behind. And when I hear the fire winged feet, they only hear the wind. Have I not chased the fluting pan through Cranham's sober trees? Have I not sat on Painswick Hill with a nymph upon my knees? And she as rosy and as, as the dawn and naked as the breeze. One of the things that really is important about this sort of new way of writing about Pan is it would become sort of the way that most modern pagans would write about Pan and then later especially the horn god. One of my favorite bits is a little more Orphic and it talks about Pan as like being this ultimate, ultimate power. This is from a poet named Charles Algernon Swinburne who is probably my favorite Victor uh, poet of the Victorian era in the 19th century. Uh, he writes in a poem called A Nymphalette. I dare not sleep for delight of the perfect hour, lest God be wroth that his gift should be scorned of man. The face of the warm bright world is the face of a flower, the word of the wind and the leaves of the light winds fan, as the word that quickened at first into flame and ran, creative and subtle and fierce with invasive power, through darkness and cloud, from the breath of the one God, Pan. Oh, it gives me chills when I think about it. Perhaps the most influential of all modern pieces dealing with Pan comes from a children's book written by Kenneth Graham, The Wind in the Willows. The Wind in the Willows, if you ever go to Christian sites and read uh, like reviews of it, they say nice things about it until the they get to one particular chapter called The Piper at the Gates of Dawn. And here Kenneth Graham kind of gives this full flowering of the idea that Pan is the god of the countryside, the very heart and soul of nature. It's a really beautiful passage. The whole chapter is worth reading. You don't have to read the rest of the book for it to make any sense. All you have to do is read that chapter. And there's like this tug and this pull as you read it as you get closer and closer to Pan. One of the things about the chapter that's so like awe-inspiring to me is when he writes about the God, when he calls him an august presence, he capitalizes the word presence. You know, he's talking very, very referentially about the God Pan in this small passage, this small chapter in this much bigger book. The main characters of The Wind in the Willows are animals, mole and rat, and in this chapter they're looking for a baby otter, and they eventually find the baby otter, but they also discover something else there. This is a little bit of that. This is the place of my song dream, the place the music played to me, whispered the rat as if in a trance. Here in this holy place, here if anywhere, surely we shall find him. Then suddenly the mole felt a great awe fall upon him, an awe that turned his muscles to water, bowed his head and rooted his feet to the ground. It was no panic terror. Indeed, he felt wonderfully at peace and happy, but it was an awe that smote and held him. And without seeing, he knew it could only mean that some august presence was very, very near. With difficulty, he turned to look for his friend and saw him at his side, coward, stricken, and trembling violently. And still there was utter silence and the populous bird-haunted branches around them. And still the light grew and grew. Perhaps he would have never dared to raise his eyes, but that, though the piping was now hushed, the call and the summons seemed still dominant and imperious. He might not refuse were death himself waiting to strike him instantly, once he had looked at mortal eye on things kept rightly hidden. Trembling, he obeyed and raised his humble head. And then, in that utter clearness of the eminent dawn, while nature flushed with fullness of incredible color, seemed to hold her breath for the event, he looked in the very eyes and, of the friend and helper, saw the backward sweep of the curved horns glowing in the growing daylight, saw the stern hooked nose between the kindly eyes that were looking down on them humorously, while the bearded mouth broke into a half smile at the corners saw the rippling muscles on the arm that lay across the broad chest, the long supple hand still holding the panpipes, only just fallen away from the parted lips. 
saw the splendid curves of the shaggy limbs disposed in majestic ease on the sward. Saw, all this he saw for one moment, breathless and intense, vivid on the morning sky. And still as he looked, he lived. And still as he lived, he wondered. Rat, he found breath to whisper shaking. Are you afraid? Afraid, murmured the rat, his eyes shining with unutterable love. Afraid of him? Oh, never, never. And yet, and yet, oh, mole, I am afraid. Then the two animals crouching to the earth bowed their heads and did worship. I love that passage because it really points out the transition of Pan from this rustic ancient Greek god who used to chase nymphs uh, to this much more awe-inspiring majestic god who became who began to be seen as the god of the eternal countryside and a pathway into the heart of nature. Uh, I believe that the gods progress and change and I feel like this was probably Pan's doing as a way that we could experience his mysteries more easily in a much more civilized world than where he was born in ancient Arcadia, all those many, many centuries and millennia ago. I've been rambling for 50 minutes. Uh, thank you all so much for listening to me ramble. I forgot to change the pictures. Um, but thank you all. If you have any questions, I love questions. If you don't, that's great too. Uh, but thank you all so much for being here. And I can't believe I was the lead off person for this event. There's like so much stress and pressure there. Um, Jason, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And I think it really um, fits in with the theme for this weekend because um, Inanna Ishtar is the goddess of sexuality and that, you know, this, this was so much a part of the sacred sex track, I think, what you've been talking about and the poetry was beautiful. So thank you so much for that. Does anyone have any questions? I know that uh, when we were talking uh, before the festival, I had sort of suggested that perhaps um, Tammuz or Demuzi, the consort of uh, Inanna could be traced back to uh, or forward to Pan. And do you have any thoughts about that or? I've never seen anything suggesting that, but uh, Tammuz and Demuzi, they do show up in a, one story about Pan. So there's a very interesting story that occurred at about the year probably 35 under the reign of the Emperor Tiberius. And there's a riverboat captain and he's taking a bunch of people on a like on a journey uh, from one port to the other and he passes an island and he hears a voice yelling, the great God Pan is dead. And the voice asks him to share the news. And, you know, they kind of, he ignores it. But then he hears it again. The great God Pan is dead. And everybody on the boat hears this. And the captain is addressed by name, though no one yelling from this island should know the name of the captain. And there are a lot of people who've interpreted that in various ways over the years. Us, uh, some people have connected it, connected it to the myth of Demuzi, like it was a misheard thing and they really weren't talking about Pan at all and that the riverboat captain sort of misheard. Uh, but it is sort of an interesting thing and it could imply some sort of connection between the two. One of the reasons that story has probably survived into the modern era is because Christians looked at it as sort of this suggestion that all of the gods had died at that particular moment because it seemed to be kind of uh, contemporary probably when Jesus was crucified. Though that's really kind of a ridiculous thing. But it's a really strange story. And the emperor Tiberius, when he heard about the story, he was so interested in it 
that he went and he uh, had people look into it just to see what had happened. There's no surviving papers about him looking into it, but he thinks that, but people have said over the centuries that it was probably Tammuz who was the figure that died or perhaps the Greek Adonis and the riverboat captain heard things wrong. So there's a little bit of overlap there. Great. Um, I just wanted to, okay, there's a question in the chat. What is the relation between Pan and Selenus? I have never seen anything that suggested there was a particular relationship between the two. However, as a companion of Dionysus, they certainly would have been known to each other. Uh, but Pan really isn't pictured with the satyrs extremely often. He kind of it, he kind of seems to exist um, away from them. And Salinas, anyways, he had the horse instead of the goat uh, attributes. So they really, I've never really seen any overlap. Uh, none of the things that I've read have really connected the two in any way, though, you know, there's, it's hard to tell with Greek mythology because, you know, we've lost a lot of things and a lot of the stories are told differently depending on where you are. Gotcha. Um, Anna has a question. Do you want to unmute Anna? Okay. Hey, thanks, Samara. Um, hi, yes, Jason, thank you so much for sharing all that beautiful literature and, you know, those historical findings of Pan. Um, so it's, I won't go into my family background with Pan, but I do want to ask a question. And I, I heard you speaking earlier to, you know, how people would gather together and, uh, you know, and have celebratory orgies and things like that. Um, but I guess, I guess a question that I would like to ask, say if a person was to want to work with him in, you know, just like a one-on-one -on -one fashion or, you know, just kind of commune with him more than anything. Uh, what is a responsible way to do that? Because it's, it's a very, yeah. it's a very ancient, ancient force and him along with several other deities aren't exactly for weak, weak willed fluffy bunny stuff. So, um, so I was wondering uh, how, how would one responsibly be able to meet his essence and, and not necessarily be overtaken by it? I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I, you know, I think the best way to always establish a relationship with deity is to talk to deity. I mean, I guess the word praying, though some people in the bigger pagan world don't like that word. I think that's always the best place to start, but also offering libations. And mm -hmm. luckily Pan is pretty easy to offer libations to because he loves wine. So, you know, pouring wine out for him on the earth and dedicating it to him, I think is a powerful way to build a relationship. I think that in today's day and age, though Pan is not all sunshine and happiness, and that we need to be wary. I've had really like positive interactions one-on-one. -on -one. What I would never suggest somebody do is, you know what, we should invoke Pan and like draw down Pan into a human body before doing some sort of shared ritual or because I think that can lead to trouble, especially if the person doesn't have a relationship with him. One of the best ways to get closer to Pan because he's a god of napping. The ancients thought that you could communicate with him in dreams, but generally dreams that take place during the afternoon. Uh, so if you're trying to build a relationship, if you're going to take a nap, you might burn a little incense, pour Pan a libation, and then settle down to see if you get anything from the god. I, I don't think that, you know, especially one-on-one, -on -one, anything is really, he's really going to jump out and do anything negative. Again, masturbation was something that was sacred to Pan. That could be another way to get in touch with the God. I mean, it's kind of an uncomfortable thing to talk about in some circles, but 
I do believe it's an effective way to get closer to Pan because it's something that he likes and respects. And again, it's not something I think it's going to create problems. I had a girlfriend once who was obsessed with like invoking Pan and like then doing things. And I was like, that is a very bad idea because he can be very, very hard to control. Um, if you do things and there's a lot of Pan energy, uh, you may want to do that by yourself. And you may want to go and ground afterwards, make sure you have some food around because that'll kind of settle things. He can be, when he shows up, sometimes it can be very hard to get him to leave because I do think he likes earthy things. We have this issue a lot uh, sometimes in ritual when he does show up. Uh, one of the best, if you need to get rid of him, he does kind of scare easily. So if you like flip on some lights really quick or something, you can get his energy to kind of begin to dissipate. But yeah, I think to be wary of him is important. And I think a lot of people are not. They just, they see Pan in mit, like English literature and think he's just happy fun God. But there's those uh, sort of more negative aspects that are always there. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I appreciate that you touched on that. So, you know, um, uh, my, let me put it this way. My family history wasn't too happy with him. So, yeah. <laughs> So that's why I was curious as to a communion that wasn't, that wouldn't result in, you know, a completely chaotic spiral. So thank you for helping with that. I don't know if I did. You can always like send me an email or a Facebook message or something. Um, if you have any questions. Which brings me to, there is a, a link on our website, uh, www.handsofchange.org slash Ishtarfest that goes directly to Jason's bio and has some contact information in it. So if you need to get in touch with him, you can do that. You're also on Facebook, right, Jason? For now, we'll see. We'll see after the election. I'm hearing that from a lot of people. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much for this. Uh, it was fascinating and uh, so many people in the chat have said thank you and it's beautiful. So. We really appreciate your time and your uh, wisdom. Thank you all. It's really weird to do these without like live people that you can hear. So I was a little off and I really apologize. No, it was great. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so for those of you, I'm gonna stop the recording.